What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? I've titled my sermon today, Finding Hope in Hopelessness. An ironic title, perhaps, but I'd like to preach today not on the Gospel of John, but instead on the reading from the book of Acts that we heard a few moments ago. So to summarize it once again, we heard about a girl, a slave, who was following Paul and Silas around when they were in Macedonia. And this girl has an apparent spirit of divination. So she's like a fortune teller. And she's following Paul and Silas and saying things loudly, like that they're servants of the Most High God. And I would think that Paul might welcome this kind of attention. This girl seems to be evangelizing with them, but Paul doesn't welcome this kind of attention. He sees something about this girl that is trapped, both by human exploitation and also by an unclean spirit. So he turns to the girl and he casts the spirit out. But then the owners of that slave girl, they become very mad. Their exploitative means of income have just been taken away. And so they take Paul and Silas into the city where the authorities find them guilty of advocating customs that are not lawful for Romans. And these authorities then have Paul and Silas stripped and beaten and thrown into jail. And not just thrown into jail, but even having their feet bound in stocks. It was a bleak situation. And if you know anything about Roman flogging, they would have been severely beaten, left near death. And after all of that, in the middle of the night, Paul and Silas begin to pray and to sing hymns. What else could they do? It was a hopeless situation. And then, an earthquake hits, and it rattles the walls, and it throws open the prison doors, and it, it casts the shackles off of all the men. And the jailer, the one man whose job it was to secure all the prisoners, he wakes up, and he sees the doors open. And this leads him to believe that all those whom he was supposed to guard have now fled. Out of fear that he'll be killed for this mistake, this man takes his own sword and is about to take his own life. And it's at that point that Paul yells out to him, telling him not to harm himself. Everyone is here. No one has fled. No one has left. The man is astonished and, I would think, likely confused. So he makes his way into the jail cell and, trembling, before Paul and Silas, he asked them that most important question, what must I do to be saved? Now we might ask today the obvious counter question, saved from what? What exactly did this man want to be saved from? Saved from the fear of punishment? Saved from an impending death? Saved from some kind of bondage? Saved from sin? Saved from what? Well, what we know is that this man was lost. He was alone, he was confused, and I believe that he sensed that something was missing in his life. Even though the jailer was a free man, I think he saw a different kind of freedom in Paul and Silas who happened to be the imprisoned men standing in front of him. This is what I know to be true. There are countless ways to be lost and alone and hurting and in need of being saved. There are countless ways to be lost and in need of being saved. There is a TV show that I'm especially hooked on right now on Amazon Prime Video. And it's a show called I Shouldn't Be Alive. I Shouldn't Be Alive. 
And while that sounds like some kind of goofy reality show, it's, it's not at all. It's a documentary style show that reenacts horrifying ordeals that have happened to individuals. Events that almost have taken their life, thus the show's title, I Shouldn't Be Alive. And almost all of these horrific events take place in the wilderness, in the desert, on a mountain, in the woods, in the ocean, miles and miles away from help and medical aid. And to kind of provide some detail and context, I'd like to ask you to sit back for a moment and I'm, I'm gonna tell you kind of what a typical episode looks like. So imagine with me a typical episode of I Shouldn't Be Alive. Now in a typical episode, you might have a woman or a man who is an avid outdoorsman and they wanna go camping, let's say, and they're, they're a very good hiker. They know how to live off the land. They know how to do well out in the woods. So they, they go by themselves because they want solitude. They love the solitude of camping. And they go to a mountain and they set up camp. And because, again, they're an avid hiker, they decide it's a beautiful afternoon and they'll take an afternoon hike. They know this mountain well. And so they get on a well-marked trail, and they begin hiking. Now, they only pack enough for an afternoon. They'll be back at camp in a little bit. So maybe they pack a towel, a bottle of water, uh, maybe a cell phone to take photos with, and maybe a granola bar. Not much. It's not going to be a long hike. And they take off on the path, and they get to a point that they remember that if they go down the mountain a little bit, maybe a quarter of a mile off the path, they'll have a beautiful vista view of the valley below. And it's a beautiful day, and they'd love to get a photo of that valley. But they can't get it from the well-marked path. But again, they've been to this mountain a lot. They're very skilled at hiking, and so they go down the mountain a little bit off the path, about a quarter of a mile. No, wait, it's a little bit further. They need to go down about half a mile off the path, and they get to the spot. They see the whole valley. It's beautiful. And there is a cliff, but they know not to get too close to the cliff. So they take a few photos, and then they know that if they go north a little bit, they can meet back up with the path and make it back to camp safely. And so being walking, Something happens, they slip on a rock, and they fall 20 feet off a cliff, and they break their leg immediately upon impact. Now what do they do? They're in a ravine. They didn't see anyone else hiking on the path. They yell out, but no one. They know that they're at least a half a mile away from the path, and they didn't see anyone else on the path. They think to pull out their cell phone, but no reception in the middle of the woods. And they know that they have a bottle of water and a granola bar, but that's only gonna last them, keep them alive a few days. And they also know that no family is expecting them back for two, three, four days. So no one is gonna come looking for them if they don't make it back to camp. How do they stay alive? And in a typical episode, it may be days or even weeks until help arrives. And in every episode, I've noticed something unique, and it's going to kind of build to my concluding point. Each person who's become stranded or lost, they all come to the same emotional point in every episode. They all reach a point of hopelessness. They get to a point of facing the reality of death, and they slowly have to accept that that may be their fate. Each individual in every episode of the show has exhausted every means of being found, every means of being rescued, every means of being saved. And most of them have relied only on themselves. That's how they've been taught to rely on themselves, and now they can no longer do that. And they always hit that point of complete exhaustion. 
without food, without water, and without anything in them to continue. Complete hopelessness. And I find in this TV show a spiritual metaphor. In life, we all need to face that moment of hopelessness. A moment of recognizing our need of outside help. A moment of acknowledging that we can't save ourselves. What must I do to be saved, the jailer asks. Well, I think that man is on the right path already because he knows that he needs to be saved. Salvation begins with our need of it. My point today is simply this, that to fully experience the life-changing love and forgiveness of God, we have to believe that we need it. Too many people go through life not knowing this renewing love found in Jesus. And while the love of God is always around us and available to us, we don't experience it until we know that we need it. We miss the point of salvation if we believe that we on our own can be enough. Our country, too, has come to a point of hopelessness, I believe. The United States of America is in need of desperate healing and new life. We are stuck, lost, addicted to things that are killing us. And like someone stranded in the wilderness, we need some kind of outside help. We have exhausted every means of attempting to curtail something that we can't fix. We need some kind of divine help that can only come from beyond us. We cannot get out of this mess on our own. What must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas say to the man, believe on the Lord Jesus. That's what they tell him. They don't tell him to go out and to find a way to become more devout or more disciplined. They tell him to simply believe in someone beyond himself, in something beyond his own ability. And to trust in that truth that Paul and Silas said to the man means this. Simply believe that God is already saving you. Simply believe that you need to be saved. And simply believe that your own efforts will not be enough. And then, only then will healing and salvation find you.